came to the UK, no one knew what Apache was. We have always been a very small community. You know, when people ask my religion, I think I'm normally met by, well, what's that then? Well, not many people actually know who Parsis are. When you first came to this country, when you were growing up, did anyone know what a Parsi was? No. Do you know what a Parsi is? Sorry. A Parsi. A Parsi. A Parsi. Do you know what a Parsi is? No. Do you know what a Zoroastrian is? No. Do you know what a Zoroastrian is? No. Zoroastrianism is the worship of all things beginning with the letter Z, and a Parsi is an edible rock found in the hilltops of the Himalayas. <laughs> The truth is, I'm lying. But as you just saw, hardly anyone knows what a Parsi is. Here's where I come in. My name's Ava, I'm a Parsi, and I was born into the religion of Zoroastrianism. But wait, no, no, but before you think you've mistakenly got onto some crazy convert channel, I'll tell you what it means in less than 20 seconds. Zoroastrianism is the world's first monotheistic religion and was founded by the prophet Zoroaster approximately 3,500 years ago. The prevailing message for this religion is good thoughts, good deeds and good words. The Parsis are a group of Persians who fled Iran in the 10th century to escape persecution and ended up on the shores of Gujarat in India. The, the strength that the Parsis have had throughout history is that wherever they've gone they've been able to blend in chameleon-like. So you never see any problems of ghettos of Parsis or racial strife caused by Parsis because in the main we, 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 we blend in and, and add value and so we're not seen as a threat by the indigenous populations. Berjo Avari was awarded an MBE in recognition of his work in multicultural education and has written a book on India's ancient past. I went to speak to him at Manchester Metropolitan University. We do not convert people, we do not go out as missionaries to try to make people Parsi or Zoroastrian. In other cultures, in other religions, Christian, Muslim, even Hindus, there are a lot of them going out and all the time trying to convert people. Do you think anyone cares that we are um, dwindling in numbers? Parsi is just genetically produce few children um, uh, and again that may have something to do with uh, work, education, uh, modern life and so on. Most or many Parsi women uh, go to work right? and so again there is less pressure on them to have more children. One of the most well-known Parsis was Farouk Bulsara but you may know him as this guy. In India alone, the Parsis have contributed wholly to the armed forces, industry, science, medicine, politics, sports and philanthropy. In fact, Gandhi is quoted as saying, I am proud of my country, India, for having produced the splendid Zoroastrian stock, in numbers beneath contempt, but in charity and philanthropy, perhaps unequalled, certainly unsurpassed. The first elected Indian member of the British Parliament in 1892 was Dr. Dadaboy Naraji, a Parsi. The British government granted baronetcy and knighthood for three Parsis, an honour which has no parallel in Indian history. So Jumsetji Jiji Boy, a self-made man who had grown up in poverty to then in later life finance and construct hospitals, schools, wells and reservoirs. By the time of his death in 1859, he was estimated to have donated over £230,000 to charity. Sadin Shah Petit, who devoted his wealth to philanthropic objects such as a hospital for animals and a college for women. And Sir Kawasji Jahangir, a wealthy man who was educated at Cambridge and went on to help the British whilst they ruled India. Zubin Mehta is a household name globally with his own star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for his services to Western classical music, 
and the first woman to study law at Oxford was Cornelia Sorabji in 1889. Yep, you guessed it, a Parsi. Christians, Muslims, uh, Jews have derived many ideas of theirs from our religion. They don't acknowledge it, unfortunately. They don't like to acknowledge it uh, because obviously they see themselves as a superior religion. But if you study Professor Himmels' books on Zoroastrianism, you will find that he has very clearly uh, explained to us uh, how many of our ideas percolated into Christianity, Islam and Judaism. Today, the Tata Group is one of India's largest conglomerates with a multi-brand global portfolio valued at over £23 billion. If you actually look at the, the charitable institutions that the Parsis have set up, you know, uh, uh, perhaps through the lens of, of, of uh, Tata and Sons and you see the schools and you see the hospitals and you see the libraries and the other institutions that have been set up for the betterment of man and that's the difference between Parsi giving and perhaps other brands of giving. In 2015 the Forbes list of billionaires had three Parsis in the top 10 rich list despite being only 0.005% of India's population. So why doesn't anyone know about us? Actually more people than I thought know about Zoroastrianism. Uh, not necessarily Parsi Zoroastrianism but definitely Zoroastrianism as a religion. This is Ross and Zenobia Barrett Mehta. Ross is agnostic and Zenobia is a Parsi. I talked to them about their mixed faith marriage and views on the dwindling Parsi population. I mean, if there's only one way to stay in the faith, which is, or stay in, in the culture, which is um, both, of two, you. both two Parsis going together to make further Parsis. And there are many, many ways of getting out of the faith just by ignoring it, by marrying out, by being yeah. kicked out for any other reason that's not actually part of the Zoroastrian faith then, of course, it's going to be a dwindling. But not all Parsis share the same concerns about their religion and decreasing numbers. This is Jamshed Patel, or Jamie, as he likes to be called. He's a young Parsi from the north of England and grew up in a liberal Zoroastrian family, as most young Parsis do. He has a slightly different attitude from the other people I spoke to and doesn't feel as strongly towards his roots. So when they ask you about your culture, what do you say? It's the British culture. I have a proper British culture. Yeah. So you don't really mention that you're Parsi? But I do, that's the thing. So I mention it, I say, look, this is my culture, this is my religion, but I see myself as a British. Why do you see yourself as British? Because I'm not religious. I've kind of just, I don't know what to believe. Sometimes I believe there's God, sometimes I don't. Because of that, I've not bothered thinking about it anymore, you know? In 2013, the Ministry of Minority Affairs in India were so worried about the number of Parsis going down that they spent 1.2 million quid on trying to get more Parsi couples together and to get them having more kids. It's called the Geo Parsi Scheme. The deaths in the community are six times more than the births. I went to speak to Jimmy Madden, a priest at the Zoroastrian Centre in London, about the scheme. It's the only Zoroastrian centre in the entire UK. Uh, one scheme that I wanted to ask you about was the Geoparsi scheme. Have you heard of it and what is your opinion on that? Uh, yes, I have heard uh, about the Geoparsi scheme and it's about getting the young Parsis to, first of all, marry early and not only that but to also provide fertility treatments and things like that for uh, parents finding it difficult to get kids and to encourage people to have at least two children. So that's why the government has funded this entire scheme and it really wants to keep the legacy of the Parsis alive because pretty much the entire foundations of India were built on, uh, were built by the, by the Parsis. In the wedding ceremony, would you say most of the marriage ceremonies you perform are two Parsis getting married, a Parsi man and a Parsi woman, or have you been doing more mixed faith, mixed heritage, mixed race marriages? Well, I have been actually performing more mixed race marriages, surprisingly. Well, in the last three years, I must be performing at an average of uh, 15 weddings a year, 10 to 15 weddings a year, sometimes 10 in a month. And of them, around three 
to four weddings would be full Parsis. Have you ever, as an Obia, felt pressure or any burden to marry a Parsi boy or a Zoroastrian boy? Um, I wouldn't say it was a pressure or a burden, it was just expected, certainly when I was growing up. And I think at some point, uh, mum and dad realised. Mm, probably won't happen. For me, I feel a slight pressure and a slight burden on my shoulders to prolong the culture for maybe another 50, 60 years. Did you have a pressure? I think there was some pressure and at the same time there was freedom to do what you wanted. But in my own case, to be very personal, uh, I always had a soft spot for Zareen. <laughs> From, from childhood because we, we knew each other from our East African connections. So I had her in my background all the time, you know? So there we are. <laughs> now that you are a father and you've got sons and a daughter, um, what is your attitude to your children now marrying outside of the religion? When it comes to marriage again, uh, they, can, they have a choice. They can either um, go to London where there's a sizable passive population or they can go to, if they choose that is to marry Parsis, or they can make a trip to India and try and find their partners there, or they can marry anyone of their own choosing, in which case myself and my wife being broad-minded, we will not come in their way. From generation to generation, we've uh, not passed down the religion actually, and we've just passed down the customs and the traditions and the rituals blindly, without understanding the meaning of them or without understanding the significance of our prayers and things like that. So that's one of the reasons I think there is very little awareness of Parsis and Zoroastrianism in general uh, for the general public and for our community itself. Certainly I think Zoroastrianism will endure, but as to whether the Parsis do or not depends on whether some um, sane minds take charge of the community as a whole and open it up and say, look, we have something that's worthwhile here, come and join us. We're all humans under one creator. So imagine if we all believe that. Wouldn't the world be a nicer place? A friendlier place? No? Mm -hmm. It would, wouldn't it? Mm. Growing up, I've been mistaken for different races, which is quite fun. Middle Eastern, Mediterranean, even South American. I've also been mistaken for different religions, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh. And it's made me question what shapes someone's identity and what people think when they look at me. I've often wondered why my religion wasn't taught in the classroom, why I've always had to tick other in the ethnicity drop-down box, and why I've always felt slightly left out. As I get to an age where society expects me to settle down and have kids, the burden to procreate within my ever-shrinking community grows greater and I find myself being torn between my 3,500 year old roots and my contemporary British way of life. So what do I think the future holds for the Parsis? Well, the Geo-Parsi scheme goes some way, but not far enough. Zoroastrians and Parsis all across the globe, from Azerbaijan, where a new temple was recently built, to India, where the community now totals at a mere 69,000, to a small northern town called Blackburn, where there are only three Parsi families left. We need to come together, communicate, and preserve what I think is a beautiful philosophy for life, with an eclectic, sometimes eccentric group of people behind it. Whatever happens, I too, like Gandhi, am proud of my people, the Parsis, and proud to be Parsi. My darling.